Good evening, tribe. We have Beverly here with us. She's going to talk to us all about hospice. We had quite a few people interested, so I am excited to see some of you tune in. Hi, Beverly. Hi. Good to see everyone or yes. with everyone tonight. Yes. Thank you so much for giving us your time out of your retired schedule. I love that. <laughs> So tell us a little bit about your experience in hospice and what led you to hospice. Well, you know, I graduated from nursing school when I was 20. And I okay. think back at it now and it's like, who lets a 20 year old be an RN? But, <laughs> you know, we did it. We made it. Um, it took 19 years to get to hospice, which when I was in nursing school, never would have dreamed of. My friends were on the cancer ward and I said, how depressing. And they said, oh no, it's wonderful. And I thought, yeah, right. So uh, my first uh, six months was orthopedics. And then I went to Medford, which was wonderful. And then I thought I'd like to try something different. So I was visiting nurse for about six months. And then um, my husband's a, a retired special ed teacher. And I got a call from his uh, school district to come in and interview on our wedding day for a position no. <laughs> as a school nurse for um, special ed. So I took okay. a position until I was 25 and we had our first baby and then um, a couple months later adopted a child. And it, so I was 25 and then at the age of 34, I was diagnosed with breast cancer for the first time. Oh. Yeah. Um, in the time that I was raising the kids, before that, I was doing some private duty. And that private duty nursing helped me to really focus on one patient and their needs and one family and their needs. And um, mm -hmm. when I did um, special ed, I found it quite interesting that I had a population of about 110 students and only one could talk. So yeah. I had to learn uh, to really assess well what was going on with them. Mm -hmm. so, um, the med surge gave me a very good basis in you know learning my meds and uh, you know doing assessments well. So at the age of 34 with breast cancer and four little mm kids. -hmm. Um, I got very depressed and my husband says, you need to go out and get a job. So mm -hmm. just a half a mile down the street was a, um, an extended care facility. So mm -hmm. I went and started working there. I worked with the general population, the older folks for two years. And then um, there was a specialized unit that they began because it was the, it was the beginning of uh, the DRGs coming in where a lot of folks were being kicked out of the hospital. You, you didn't go in there on a vacation anymore, which would happen when I was um, a young nurse. Um, people would be there for a week or two. And so this specialized unit, um, it was people that needed extra care, um, such as uh, peritoneal dialysis we were doing. Mm -hmm. Um, we said that we did hospice, um, and uh, it was the beginning of, of the AIDS uh, illness starting. Mm -hmm. We were about the only nursing home that would take AIDS patients. Okay. Um, so I learned then that what I really, really wanted to do, and I worked in that unit for two years, that I wanted to do hospice, but I was making really good money, and I was you know, working, you know, 12 hour shifts. And I thought, how can I leave? And I said, I just asked mm -hmm. to tell me when to go. And I did something really stupid that I got in big trouble over. And I was told if I made another mistake in 18 months, I'd be fired. Mm -hmm. And I will make a mistake. So I thought it's time to go. I looked mm -hmm. in, in the Detroit news. We had ads back in those days. And there was a yeah or um, they were asking for a full-time hospice nurse in a suburb near me. And I thought, that's my job. And I went after it and I got it. And I was just thrilled. I had finally found what I love. And that's awesome. How many years did you spend in hospice overall? 29. 
Oh, wow. So yes. how many years do you serve as a nurse for, in totality? Uh, 44 and a half. It'll be 45 years. Wow. I know. Thank you so much for your extended service. That is amazing. Thank you. I've loved it. <clears throat> Totally. Yes. So those of you that are joining us, uh, thank you so much. Beverly just introduced herself and and what her experience has been up until her hospice time. So we haven't even gotten into the meat and potatoes of hospice yet. Um, feel free to ask your questions, put them in the comments and I'll ask them as our conversation flows. Um, we have a comment here. I'm 45 and started nursing school just to be a hospice nurse. I volunteer at an inpatient unit every week. It's one of my favorite places to be. Thank you for doing this. So. Oh, that's wonderful good yes yeah do you feel like hospice is a good place for a new grad to start no you really ought to get a little bit of med surge in to really get mm. your skills down okay because you're yeah. out there if you're going to start hospice you're going to be out there by yourself you will have the support of the hospice physicians you could call them anytime and you also have the support of other hospice nurses and that's basically mm -hmm. how you learn hospice is by working in hospice. Okay. Okay. So, you know, a year or two of med surgery probably be best. Yeah. A year or two. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's good pointers. Um, can you talk a little bit about what kind of hospice differences there are in terms of inpatient and outpatient? Okay. Well, I've done everything there is in hospice, except for okay. seeing a patient under an underpass, which I have heard has happened. So, uh, yeah, I know. I started out <laughs> doing home care hospice, which I loved. Um, and it is for um, the majority of the patients are, 90% um, of them are in home or in, in extended care facilities. And okay. we visit patients at least once a week, if not twice a week. And if their condition worsens, then we're going to be in there more frequently. Okay. okay. Um, in the hospital, someone's in the hospital because they um, have just perhaps come in with a, something they're going to die of within the week. And, um, or they've got a symptom out of control say they've got severe pain or they've got nausea and vomiting that won't quit, um, then they would, they would remain impatient. Um, the government only likes us to let them stay for a few days um, if, if they're gonna die, but we're not throwing anybody out on the street. If you're gonna die within the week, that's quite reasonable you know, for them to remain in the hospital. And I also, I also did, um, hospital nursing for many, many years. Um, they, hospital, hospital nursing? Uh, yeah, hospital nursing with the hospice. Okay. And in the hospital with hospice patient, we contract with the hospital to care for our patients and we pay them a per diem. And mm -hmm. so the nurses in the hospital take care of them and we round on those patients daily. Okay, so it's usually a nurse visit is almost every single day. A uh, social worker works very closely with the nurse uh, there at almost every visit, and the chaplain is also coming in. Um, a physician, um, if it's not the hospice physician, then the attending is also seeing the patient daily. So we're working okay. hard on um, controlling symptoms, making sure they're comfortable, um, it is, to me, the best kind of nursing there is because we are doing emotional, spiritual, and physical care. It's all of it. And, mm -hmm. it's, and it's, it's such a blessing to be able to work with the social workers and the chaplains and the doctors and the home health aides because we are truly a team which I always learned in nursing school, that's what it was going to be about. And it wasn't Absolutely. always about that. So, yeah, yeah. So only 10% of the population can be in the hospital um, of hospice at, at a time. That That's Medicare. Okay. Yeah. 
And we also have volunteers. You must have uh, a large percentage of volunteers for hospice. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's interesting. Um, can I get you to tilt your screen towards you just a little bit? I have a title that's kind of cutting your chin off. There we go. That's beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, uh, so we've gotten quite a few um, questions coming in. How much autonomy do you have in hospice? A lot, a lot of autonomy. Um, it's changed. I think it's tightening up in the last few years. Um, we used to have standing orders that we would come into a home, um, see that a symptom was out of control, and knew that there was something we could do immediately without having to call a physician immediately. Right. So um, there is a lot of autonomy. Um, it, it, yeah, it it is a wonderful thing. Um, I've taught other nurses that were afraid to be out there by themselves. You know, they yeah. said... I don't really know if I know hospice. And I said, let me tell you something. You know more than the family. And they went, oh, mm. that's right. That's right. Yeah. So. Absolutely. For sure. So do you work with all ages in within your hospice practice or was it just adults? Uh, there was a time where um, the first hospice I worked at, thought it would be a good idea if the pediatric nurse was off, then whatever nurse that was covering that area would be with that case. And uh -huh. I was actually assigned a case that I, I stayed with despite seeing adults. I saw this um, two-year-old boy um, also, but um, it, was, it was upsetting to my children. They were young at the time. And, mm -hmm. you know, nurses, and we have to talk about stuff. I'd come home and, and talk about stuff. And my kids would say, Mother, if you take care of these kids, that's fine. Just don't talk about it at home. We don't want yeah, to yeah, sure. Yeah. So Hard. I did experience taking care of children. It wasn't my favorite thing. It was, it was, mm -hmm. it was much harder. Yeah. And I think generally speaking in today's or maybe in just New Mexico, maybe I should be more specific. There's a pediatric specific hospice team and then there's adult specific hospice yep. teams versus the intermixing. Yes. It's standard. That's I think it's pretty standard if if they can afford it. I mean, here, here I'm in the Detroit area and I think you know, there's maybe only two teams left oh. um the hospice that i just left they dissolved their team as far as i know mm -hmm. i could I'll be hearing from my uh former co-worker soon about that but um yeah so it's pretty oh, wow. that's unfortunate yeah yeah well i think you know there's such a small population of children on hospice that you know sure. a team for every hospice i mean in the detroit area there must be about 18 at least so okay yeah yeah that makes sense right uh do you have hospice specific doctors that you work with with uh in conjunction with the pcp um i'm sorry pcp again is a uh, primary care provider oh yes yeah okay um we do have medical directors and um, they are assigned um, different areas of uh, to cover, and then we have okay. physicians that um, hire in, and um, will also cover other territories. So um, we now at the hospital that I just left, I had been speaking to a physician who really wanted to change in his life and said he wanted to do hospice care and I said well you ought to look into it and he says oh I looked into it he told me and he'd have to do a residency and he says I'm not doing that again I mean this guy's you know in his late 50s but sure he was just hired by my former hospice to cover the hospitals and as long as he's working under a um a medical director that is a hospice physician, 
then it's fine. It's, it's okay. Good. Yeah. And so medical director, go ahead. Go, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You go ahead. Oh, I was just going to clarify. So as the nurse, if you needed any outstanding orders or something that needed to be, a, you know, a medication increase or something like that, you're, you're corresponding with your medical director within the hospice unit versus with the patient primary care provider? I can call the primary care provider if they are um, the physician involved. Whenever we do an admission of hospice, we call the um, primary care provider to see if they want to be involved in the patient's care. And if oh. they say, no, I don't want to do it, then it'll fall on the, our medical director. Oh, okay. That makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Um, let me make sure that, Amber, make sure that that clarified your question. If it didn't, please ask again and we'll try and get that clarified. Okay, so what would you say the process of training a hospice nurse is like? Maybe a, a hospital training probably is standard hospital like process, like three months, that kind of thing. What about an in-home hospice setting? What's the training like for a new nurse? Uh, they would have an excellent orientation. I know that. Um, my friend, um, that is, who is now also retired, would was the educator, and she did a fabulous job of going over anything, almost anything you would possibly cover in hospice, um, and then sending the nurse out uh, with other nurses with um, right other disciplines so they could see what was going on. Um, the nurse would be doing an admission, so a few admissions with another nurse with her. And um, her first vis visits would be with someone also. So okay. it's, it's, it's a good training. Um, I always told uh, new nurses, here's my number. You have any problems? you know, that you can't get a hold of the supervisor because sometimes we had supervisors that didn't know hospice, which was interesting. Oh. But yeah, um, yeah, I said, you know, call me and I'll help you out, you know, and then, you, then I'll have you call it, but we'll start there. So they felt like, you know, I can call Bev if need to, I need to, so. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. So was it was the orientation like a set number of shifts or set number of visits that you would visit with a nurse? Or is it based on the nurse's personal uh, comfort level? I think it was based on the nurse's comfort level. Um, okay. I remember going out with a supervisor at my orientation after I had already done 12 years of hospice. And she, the supervisor, were doing the admission and she's talking away and explaining this and that. And she just stopped and she laughed and she says, you already know all this. <laughs> so <laughs> it, was, it was, it was interesting. So it's, it's really how comfortable that nurse is, you know, sure. and if they need more support, that's fine too. So. Absolutely. Uh, Carrie asked, what would you say the biggest con of nurse hospice nursing is? Say that again. Uh, she's talking pros and cons. What would you say the biggest con of hospice nursing? Well, I think like any part of nursing, the biggest con is um, getting your charting done. Yeah. Yeah. And um you do have to work uh, maybe two weekends a month uh, depending okay. on the hospice you're working with. I know a lot of hospices are trying to uh, get their weekends fully staffed by um, people that just want to work weekends. So that's a help. Sure. So that cuts down on how much you have to work. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if you're um, out there seeing patients in homes, you've got driving to contend with, um, even in bad weather. If the, yeah. if the weather is horrendous and dangerous, then, you know, we're not going out. We're going to be calling our patients and seeing, you know, seeing how they're doing, making sure they're comfortable and they have everything they need. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So. Well, that's nice. That's a pro, right? Yeah. If, you, if your weather is super bad. Yeah. 
but she's in the Detroit weather or uh, area, guys. So that at least gives you an idea. Yeah. <laughs> Here in New Mexico, we would probably have zero reason to call off because of weather. Right. Are there specific certifications for hospice? There is a certification. Um, when it first came out, um, I took the test for certification um, and passed it. And my sister passed it the same day. Nice. <laughs> I got her to come to the hospital too. And, um, Good for you. Yeah. And when I took it, it was um, uh, a certification for hospice. And now the certification uh, includes palliative care. So it's hospice oh, okay. and palliative care. And unfortunately, um, the certification meant nothing to my employer. It didn't mean a raise in pay. It meant that I had more letters to write after my name, which was kind of sad. So after two years, I let it go. So that was kind of unfortunate. But you know what? It was wonderful for me and my sister to know, yeah, we got this. We know this stuff. So it was good. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I wonder if that's good advice for anybody who wants to take a certification um, for a, a pay raise or for some sort of purpose, aside from having a few extra letters behind your name, that you do make sure that there's some sort of benefit if that's important to you. Right. Um, yeah, that it would definitely make sense because the amount of CEUs that you have to take to keep up with it and the pay or the, the cost of the program itself, I'm sure it would be helpful if there's some sort of incentive. Yeah. So what does a typical day look like in hospice? Do you have a set schedule? Do you have call where you patients call you and say it looks like it's close to time? How do you juggle all of that? <laughs> That's what I liked about it is I never okay. knew what was going to happen in my day. So mm -hmm. if I were um, a nurse at taking care of patients at home, I would probably go into the office first and um, make a few phone calls, you know, ordering equipment, medications, whatever. And uh, nobody really would be seen at 8 o'clock in the morning. So I usually started maybe 9 o'clock going to patients' homes. And seeing okay. four or five patients a day, depending. Um, sometimes you'll get called and you'll have an admission to do, or maybe you will find out that there's an emergency that, you know, somebody uh, in severe pain or is getting close mm -hmm. to the end. So that might call for um, a, a little changing of what you're, what you're going to be doing also. And what is that type of situation like? Um, if you're going into a visit that is end of life, do you have, there's there's so much discussion about um, over medicating at the end of life and things like that. Did you, how did you handle that as a nurse and how did you feel like that really went down with your hospice patients? Um, I was never afraid of over medicating someone. Um, I never saw that morphine could kill anyone. I mean, mm -hmm. people are going to disagree with me on that. But I even had a physician at a hospital who, um, because the son asked him to, to please um, give a morphine drip until his dad died. And mm -hmm. I went in and I checked on the patient and I heard the concerns from the nurses on the floor and went up to the physician and I said, stop it, stop it now. This is not necessary. Slow down the drip. You're, you don't need to be doing this. This is, this is ridiculous, you know? So he did, but I've, I've never seen that um, a, a dose of morphine killed anybody. So, sure. and if the goal is comfort, right then it's a double-edged sword. Do we not give the medicine and let the person be uncomfortable or suffering emotionally, or do we give it and let them be peaceful? Right. So I, I always- And do you want the family kind of gauge that and, and decide if the patient is not uh, coherent enough to answer whether they like pain medicine or not? Do you just let the, do you gauge it by the family's response? 
Yeah, I do. What what the family has to say is very important. So sure. if, if they're fearful, then I, you know, work on calming those fears. And, I, you know, I don't force anybody to do anything. It's all about what they want, what they feel comfortable with. So, yeah. you know, <laughs> there's no moaning or grimacing an unresponsive patient then I'm not concerned about pain, you know? Right. But it's it's all about the patient and the family and what they say it is. So we're there to support them and help them through this time. Their, their perception is their reality, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Josh asked a really good question. He said, did you ever suffer from empathetic burnout? I did to a degree. And if okay. I did have a burnout, what I would do was change my position within the hospice. Mm. And that was enough to refresh me. So I went from uh, at one point um, being a nurse in the hospital to going over to the hospice home where it was, you know, it was 12 hours in and then out. Um, not every single day and um then i went back to the hospital and you know I, yeah it, it can happen sure but i have so a change of scenery was enough for you right right yeah just change the scenery and that did it just to refresh me and it was a good thing and That's a good idea. Do you have any other pointers for others suffering from empathetic burnout? Um, I personally found it was very important for me to have a close relationship with my coworkers. Um, mm -hmm. We'd laugh every day. You know, we yeah. just, it would break the tension. Um, we could go close the door and, um, talk about our feelings and what was going on and you know it was a good thing yeah yeah another good question from amber how do you have the conversation with a patient who is hospice appropriate but resistant to accepting hospice well i've had a lot of those conversations um i would probably go in and ask them what their goals are you know, with what the physician has told them that they can't perhaps have any more aggressive treatment, what would they like? And often they're going to say, well, I just, I just want to be comfortable. I want to go home, you know, and say, well, that's what we do. Why don't you give us a try and we'll take it a day at a time. Um, if they don't like us, they can stop hospice at any time. It is a benefit mm -hmm of Medicare, Medicaid, and most insurances with no copay. And, you know, you can, you can get off of a hospice and come back later if you change your mind. Yeah. Yeah. So it, I've had that conversation so many times and it's, it's different every time. Um, I found myself if I would get maybe a little bit too much information before I would go in and meet a patient first time and I, it would just rattle me and I'd be a little frightened and I'd just calm myself and just say a prayer and say you know Lord be with me that uh, I can say the words that need to be said to help this person and sure. the fear was gone and things would work out yeah. And I feel like a lot of times people agreeing or disagreeing with hospice, they have some some residual fear there about some sort of an unanswered question that that is typically their stronghold in not agreeing to hospice. They have some sort of fear. Right. Mis misinformation or something. Right. Yes. Yes. Well, I had. I had a mentally retarded, um, that's not a good term to use, um, low functioning older woman that had colon cancer and I was assigned to be a nurse. 
And I walked in to meet her for the first time. And she says, I know what hospice is. Get the F out. And I said, mm -hmm. you know what? We're just going to be friends. Just let me come and visit you a couple times a week. We'll just be friends. And she agreed to that. So <laughs> <laughs> she thought that could be her friend. That was okay. Yes. Yes. That was a good. Good. Idea. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Laura really wanted to see your talk and she made it out of clinicals and to your talk. She just commented, made it with exclamation points. Yay. Yay. <laughs> I'm glad you're here, Laura. Okay, so we're wrapping up our chat, um, but I do want to know, what did you love most about hospice? The relationships that I had with the patients and the families. Um, I learned to do Reiki. Um, mm. And... I was allowed to use Reiki on our patients and families, and I saw some wonderful things with that. And I, I've been blessed by the thousands of people that I've taken care of. Um, people still recognize me um, because you never forget who your family member's hospice nurse was. They never forget. In fact, every time I go to Costco, I see a woman working there, and she, I took care of her sister, so we have to stop and talk. Oh, that's precious. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Josh asked, do you have any advice for new nurses on dealing with the death of a patient? It's inevitable part of nursing that not everyone has seen. Well, um, and if you're feeling badly about that death, to remember that you did everything you could to make that person comfortable and to support them and to support their family and be a listening ear to that family and support them through this time. Um, it's, it's hard when someone that you've grown close to dies or you've taken care of for a while dies, but just to know you made their passing better. And that's mm -hmm. a beautiful thing. Yeah. Yeah. As an ICU nurse um, in the PICU, as I was getting more and more, uh, maybe comfortable is an awkward word, but comfortable with the process of death, um, I found it really comforting knowing that I was allowing them to die with dignity and that I was creating good memories for their family. Right. So whatever that looked like, you know, we would have those conversations like, would you like a piece of their hair? And Maybe that's awkward to have those conversations, but man, it makes a huge difference. Um, I was recently with my aunt at her passing and they did, um, they came in as she was dying and did a stethoscope recording of her heartbeat. Wow. And I've never seen that before. I worked at so many children's hospitals um, as a travel nurse and I've never had the opportunity to see um, that procedure. And so they gave it to some of our closest family members on disc. And so they have like her heartbeat on disc and uh, she was developmentally delayed. She was uh, down syndrome. And so my aunt who was her caregiver has that on, on recording, which I thought was pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. And that's I probably wouldn't want that, but I've never buried a child. So I don't know. Maybe I would. That's right. We don't know. Yeah. No. You don't know. Um, another good question. Let's see from Laura. She said, how do you answer the questions from the family when you visit the patient? Are you honest with them? I think she's talking about like the gravity of the illness or the diagnosis, that kind of thing. I am always honest with them. Um, mm -hmm. It's just painful to them to hear things that are not true. And the biggest question they want to know nine times out of 10 is how long. Yeah. How long until they pass, especially if they're a hospital patient. Um, and, and I will give them an educated guest uh, and say, but it is always between them and their maker. So this is what I think, but we'll see. So, yeah. Yeah. I, it's just so wrong to give them false hope um, or yeah. It's best to always tell the truth. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And my family struggled with um, telling my aunt, who's Down syndrome, the gravity of what was happening and that she was truly dying. And I really hated that. I hated that a lot. And I actually had a conversation with her myself that she was indeed dying. And so we were able to kind of process a little bit. And um, it really, it was really hard. And I don't know how often you run into those cases where the family doesn't want the patient to know that they're dying. Oh, yeah, that happens a lot. It, 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 it's, it's kind of funny to me, because I remember so many times, I'd be talking to the patient and the patient say, you know, they don't think I'm dying, but I am dying. And then you go out mm. to the family and go, don't, don't tell them that they're dying. And it's like, they already know. And they go, they yeah. Die. So, you know, and then I'm able to say to the family, why don't you just start talking about how they're feeling, you know, because they do know. So th that helps a lot with that process. Sure. But so, Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was just going to ask the audience. Um, there's quite a few viewers on. If anybody else had any questions um, before we let Beth go, this has been great. The discussion has been wonderful back and forth. You've been such a great wealth of knowledge. Thank you so much for sharing your time. Oh, thank you. Could I read something that was written for my sister that I yeah. think is beautiful? She wanted to carry the torch in the Olympics a few years ago. And her daughter wrote this for her to submit with her application. When okay. Others, when others walk out, my mother walks in. She's a hospice nurse caring for the terminally ill and their families. She carries the torch for many, those that have forgotten what it feels like to smile, those are not, that are not ready to take their final step into the unknown, and those finding that someone has, that brought meaning and purpose to their life is now gone. And you would never know, should you see her on the street, hosting a party or reading a Jane Austen novel, she would simply mm. smile and say, how are you today? But in her eyes, you would say, you would see that what she is really saying was, I love you. So, yeah. That's precious. I love that. They gave me the thoughts. Yeah. Well, it looks like um, we've had a few comments saying thank you for your time. Uh, someone apologized for being late, but they were very excited that they could watch it on replay. So again, thank you so much for your time, Bev. And I hope you enjoy your... Okay, thank you for having me. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, tribe. Have a great night.